Well, let's say we're going over chapter one, emergency medical care systems, research, and public health. So what we're just going to be going over is a little bit about um, some, sorry, I went too far, uh, how, what the EMS system is, um, the, lo the levels of care that we, the, as a provider that we have, um, our system organization standards, standards that we have to, that we work by, um, role of research, not only as to how we've gotten to where we're at, but as far as how you play as a provider, let play into uh, research in EMS. Also talk a little bit about um, how we play into public health, as well about uh, the mobile health care system and community paramedicine program. So any loss of life, um, major disability, whether from some form of catastrophic accident or illness, it's a major issue. Uh, whether it's a, you know, 10 car pile up or an epidemic that's going around or pandemic that's hit the world, it's a major issue. Thousands of people can die every year because they're unable to get the proper access to EMS to the EMS system so we can make a huge difference and ranging everything from the from dispatch for an EMR to EMT excuse me advanced EMT paramedic we all make a major difference and can play into whether or not a person potentially lives or dies so what happens today when you get injured or you get sick and you need to get to the hospital what do you do besides getting in your car and driving yourself to the hospital right you call 911 so you call 911 you tell them what's going on you know I fell broke my leg or you know I'm severely sick whatever they Dispatch a fire engine, depending on the area you're at. Dispatch an ambulance. Um, they come out there, they check you out, start treating you on scene, load you up, take you to the hospital. It's from lessons that, that was learned during wartime efforts that developed how our systems are today. Um, and it's, you know, it started in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, but it's still being done today. Um, Quick Clot, for example, uh, it was first developed during the first Gulf War, I believe. Um, and so they were like, you know, it works here. Let's use it in the, in, let's put it in the EMS. Um, the cat tourniquets that are used, it was first used during, uh, the military, during the military. Um, you know, they saw that it was a beneficial tool, so they moved, uh, brought it into the world of EMS for us to use also. You know, 50, 60 years ago, you know, if you were sick or injured, you know, if you didn't get any care, they would throw you into the back of a car or even further back at the back of a uh, a carriage or whatever and take you to the hospital. The system we know today is started in the 1960s. This is where we got our begin. EMS as a service, we're, we're still in our infancy compared to police and fire. So when we first got our start, you know, we had a lot of issues. So in 1966, you had the EMS white paper that was established, that was uh, published, um, and this, you know, suggested, uh, or not suggested, it identified issues that was going on as far as pre-hospital care. There was lack of training. There was no organization. It was the wild, wild west of EMS services. You had people racing to get to scenes to be the one to take the patient instead of an organized dispatch system. 
I've heard stories of, you know, three or four ambulances, which at the time were, in some places, were a hearst. So you'd have three or four hearsts sitting outside with a, an ambulance sticker on the side, and they were f literally fighting to take that patient to the hospital. That's the type of stuff that was going on back then. So, due to the, the white paper and other acts that's come out along through the years and advancement of us into a more professional service, we've be, uh, become a part of a continuum of care. We play into that continuum from starting at the scene of, a, of an accident or in a patient's house. Um, we're an integral part of it, ranging from the hospital discharge, you know, from our care to the ED, to hospital stay, to their discharge, to their rehab. Rehabs. If we do something wrong in the field, it affects the patient all the way through. Just like if we do something right, which we all should strive to do, to do everything that we can to save our patient, um... It can have a positive effect as to what happens to that person. Now we've had a long road to get to where we are today. There's been a lot of stuff that's been done to develop our system to where we are. For example, in the 1960s you had uh, the development of a CPR program where we were properly trained on how to do CPR, um, you know, and using an AED came along a bit further down the road, but this was the start as far as in the EMS. You had the Safety Act of 1966. What this did was it established a safety program for the highways um, that met federal standards, which included us. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration were the primary, and still today, don't get me wrong, um, as far as developing how we operate in the back, as far as driving our ambulance services, our ambulances. Um, and they helped also in the development of our curriculum back in the 60s. Um, fast forward to 1993. You had the National Registry of EMTs releasing the uh, Education and Practice Blueprint. Um, this defined issues that was going on with our training and education and served as a guide as far as developing our training curriculum. The NHTSA, they, uh, they've issued a lot of documents to help us get to this to our where we are today. In 1996, they published the agenda for the future, and what it was meant to do was to try to make a greater component in the healthcare system as far as EMS services. Um, as far as you know, and then in 2000, you had uh, the systems approach. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Getting tongue tied here. You had the systems approach that was released, and what this was done was to help address issues that, that people were having with consistency in our education, how people were being certified and licensed as far as entry-level providers nationwide. In 2006, they uh, released the scope of practice model, and this established four levels of EMS licensure. You had your EMR, you had your basic advanced and paramedic, which we'll go over in a little bit. Um, EMS at the Crossroads, this was just, uh, put out in 2006 by the Institute of Medicine. What they recommended was that there was a common scope of practice that was done nationwide, so that way providers could um, get licenses, get their license in multiple states as needed for their uh, 
for their employer. For example, in Phoenix City, providers there have to have their Alabama and their Georgia license because they're right there on the border. They transfer patients both to the hospital in Phoenix City as well as in Columbus, which is right across the border. So if it wasn't for being able to create a common scope of practice, base scope of practice, states weren't a, you wouldn't have been able to get that license. You would have had to go to another school to get your license again. It also created an accreditation program that all paramedic programs had to have. And this helped in the being able to get that reciprocity city between states. They also um, set a state standards that are recommended for us to follow. And there are 10 components to these standards. You have regulations and policies that each state must have. This helps uh, govern our EMS system. And we're also supposed to have local uh, leadership in our local jurisdictions. So you have a state medical director, uh, you know, you have your local medical director, you have your local EMS chief, um, and it goes all the way up to the state, all the way up to the federal level as far as our chain of command. You have resource management, so the purpose of this is that way all of our resources are controlled, so that way all of our equipment, is, all of our crews are able to get it, and so that way all patients have access to acceptable emergency care. Well, there's also a standard for our human resources and training. This standard states that all ambulances, all patients that are transported, are to have be staffed with at least someone at the EMT level. Someone you have to have at least have a basic EMT license to be able to ride in the back of an ambulance. Uh, there's a transportation standard. This is. Uh, this was done to provide safe, reliable transport, whether it's being you're being transported by ground ambulance or by air. There's a standard for facilities, so that way all ill or injured patients, no matter the severity of their issue, can be delivered in a timely manner to the best appropriate medical facility. Because um, there's various levels of hospitals that we can that you can take a patient to which we'll go over in uh, later chapters you also have standards for communications as far as how we communicate with the dispatcher various other personnel and as well as the hospital um, public information and education what this is for um, is that way we can educate the public in how to prevent injuries um, and how to act properly access us you know besides just calling 911 um, there's a standard for medical direction because there's always supposed to be a medical director. That Our medical director, they sign off on our skills, they allow what medications we can give. Um, they also oversee our care. Um, and they can approve whether or not you get your license. You have trauma systems. In the state of Alabama, we have the ATCC. This is our Alabama Trauma Communication Center. Um, what it does, if we have a, a trauma patient or a stroke patient, we call ATC. We tell them what we have, and they help guide us to take us to take them to an appropriate facility, based off of the capabilities of that service, or if that hospital ha it may not have neuro capabilities or uh, surgery capabilities. You know, we we don't have access to that information all the time. So ATC, they give us that information so we can ensure to get our patient to the best appropriate facility. And ultimately, there's a standard for evaluation because we have to be able to look at what the see, find the mistakes that we've made, so that way we can potentially um, evaluate it and move on and become better from it. We do have some goals. Um, we strive for uh, our quality of our clinical and our services, or excuse me, our clinical, our clinical nature, our service to be um, utmost quality. We're always looking to improve. 
so we can always provide the best care capable. I asked you earlier, you know, if you call 911, what do you do? You know, this is who, this is what happens. Um, you get her, for example. When you call 911, she answers the line. Um, if it is an E911 capable system, it allows for automatic number identification. So before you had to, ask, the dispatcher had to ask, you know, what's your phone number? Where are you? With the E911 capabilities, all of this is automatically displayed on her computer screen. Even if you accidentally hang up the call, they know where you're at and they can get help to you. It's an easy number to use, an easy number to remember. When you call 911, you're getting a specially trained person who's able to take that call for you. Um, Oh, excuse me. Um, so, as I said, you have specially trained dispatchers. There, you have emergency medical dispatchers as far as EMS that they're able to go ahead and start giving information um, and collecting information and giving uh, pre-arrival instructions to the call take or to the person who called 911 as far as if CPR needs to be done or. Um, positioning of the patient needs to be done, medications, going ahead and getting that stuff together. So that way once we get there, it's, you know, that stuff's already done and it helps us do our job. Also, if there's certain things that needs to be relayed to us that the EMD was able to collect, they can go ahead and, excuse me, they can relay that information to us. Now, what's the thing that all of us carries? Cell phones. Not many people nowadays have a house line. I'm guilty of it. I don't have a house line. Me and my wife, we both have a cell phone. It has some challenges as far as accessing a 911 system. Before, if you called 911, you know, you would have, even today, if you called 911 from a house line, it gives you you the hard uh, address. If you call 911, it gives you your 911 address pending your system is set up for it. If you call from your cell phone, if you're right there on the border of cell towers, or if you're right on the border of a county, it may not give the exact location. The, the cell tower that it's pinging off of, it may be 5, 10 miles away from you. Now there are rules that the FCC is trying to put in to kind of help give a better accuracy of the location if you call 911. Um, so obviously like I said, if you call 911, if it's a basic service, um, you know, they can they can get the, the call to you, but it's up to you to give the rest of your information. Then you have phase one E911. When this happens, the when you call 911, when they answer the line, it pops up your phone number on the computer. And it also gives a the location of the cell site. Or the cell tower that it's pinging off of. In phase two, once it gets put in, it actually provides the latitude and longitude of the caller. And it's design once it goes into place where it'll be accurate within 50 to 300 meters that's a huge help guys if I can if I can call 911 and I can at least get them within 50 meters of me they, that's a better chance of me of them finding me than you know a, going to a, a cell tower that's five miles away from me You also have uh, voice over internet protocols. Um, with this, sorry, <coughs> you have to have a feature in order to be able to call 911 with this. 
It is normally is standard. However, you have to give a physical location from the scriber of where they're where they're calling from. Now, all you have to do is have a internet uh, connection. But if you have it set up for your home, and let's say you come here to Wallace Community College, you call nine one one, but you don't change your address in the internet protocol. It's going to show up that it's that you're at home. That's not going to do you any, excuse me, that's not going to give you any help. Because they're going to go there instead of coming to Wallace. So if you have a VOIP, you need to make sure that um, you update as appropriate. All right, we're going to take about a five, ten minute break here. And we'll come back and we'll pick up from here.